Hello, I'm Lou Bloomfield and this is How Things Work. Today's topic, clocks. Measuring space is relatively easy. You can just make or pick up some sort of ruler, maybe just the, the length of your arm or the, the, the distance of your stride, the size of your foot, and you can just measure off how from, from here to there, how far is it? Well, it's a certain number of arm lengths or a certain number of steps, so on, things like that. So measuring, measuring uh, distance and therefore space has probably been, is something that, that, that just dates back forever. People have always been doing that relatively effectively. Measuring time, however, a bit trickier. There are some natural rhythms in our world that can, can essentially tick off time and we can use them to measure the passage of time. Things like the length, well, the length of the day, I gotta be careful with, but the, the time from morning to morning, and that's certainly, you know, sort of the, what we would now consider to be 24 hours. You can sort of get that right out of the natural rhythm of the Earth. Uh, the lunar month, how long it takes the moon to go around the Earth and come back to where it started from. Uh, the the, the uh, solar year, so how long it takes for, for the Earth to go around the sun, and certain things like that are just handed to us by nature. But if we want to divide up the day, or even divide up the day into, into pieces of, of some controlled length, so, so instead, uh, yeah, so, so for example, to, to, to know that, that it's lunchtime, so you don't starve to death by, by missing lunch. Eh, you gotta be a little more clever and you've gotta create something. And whereas there, Way back, there were ways to measure the passage of time sort of in, in, in single increments, like an hourglass, or the length, it, the t time it takes a candle to burn down. You could get a pretty good sense of that now is a certain time after the start of the, that one time event that you, that you triggered, like the hourglass. But if you want to just break up the day into pieces of well-defined time, uh, intervals of time, now you need some device that does this for you. And somewhere roughly 500 years ago, people figure out how to make decent clocks. And what clocks do, I mean, basically at their, at their heart, what is a clock? A clock is a device that, that ticks off periods of time using some internal system that, that, that rhythmically or, or, or predictably ticks off units of time and then a counting system that counts the passage of those, in, of those intervals, how many have gone by since you got everything started, and a source of energy that keeps the rhythmic thing going over and over again. Well, that timekeeper is gonna be the heart of this whole discussion, really. Uh, timekeepers that you could use, a bouncing ball, or um, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> An hourglass where you keep flipping it over automatically in some manner. You know, those aren't very good choices. Better choices are systems that have a natural resonance to them, that, that automatically, because of physics itself, go through a rhythmic, repetitive motion. And those are associated with stable equilibrium. So any object that has a stable equilibrium can fit the bill as basically a timekeeper. Can, it can go rhythmically through its motion. Uh, I'm thinking of a stool here teetering back and forth. This would be a really weird timekeeper for a clock. I mean, you could do that. Uh, I would not recommend it. So anything that goes back and forth about a stable equilibrium is, is, is at least a possibility. But you could do better by winnowing the field down a bit. And what do you want to winnow it down to? Well, as you can see with the, with the wobbling, wobbling stool, the time it took for the wobbling stool to go back and forth between its, its, it, around its stable equilibrium, which it has now settled into, that the, the time it took depended on, on how big the motion was. As the motion got smaller, which it did because of a loss of energy, the time it took to, to go through its, its, its swing back and forth about the stable equilibrium got shorter. So this, if, if we try to make a, a clock out of a, out of a stool rocking back and forth about its stable equilibrium, a couple things. First off, we would have to be investing new energy into it all the time because you could see how quickly it ran out of oomph. It settled down into its equilibrium 
and had run out of the extra energy that drives it back and forth about that stable equilibrium. So you're going to be putting energy into it a lot. But more importantly, you're going to have to be very, very picky about how far it swings about its equilibrium. Because if it swings only a little about equilibrium, it's going to be ticking quickly. And if it's swinging a lot about equilibrium, big distances, what is called a large amplitude of motion, it's going to be slower. So this is a clock that depends on how far the, the timekeeper swings back and forth on the amplitude of the timekeeper's motion. Eh, not likely to be very accurate. You're going to miss a lot of meetings or appointments or things you care about. So we're going to just not build a clock around a rocking stool. What can we do that's better? Well, we can turn to an entire category of systems with stable equilibria, equilibria that move back and forth about those equilibria and have a wonderful property that the time it takes them to complete a motion uh, about that equilibrium, what is known as the period of the motion, how long it takes to go from its start to the, to the, to the finish, which is again the start of the next motion. So, so you're doing one entire cycle of the motion. That's period. So you want a, a, a system that does this with a rhythm that does not depend on the amplitude of the motion. So whether it goes, does a little cycle or a big cycle, you get the same time from start to finish of that single cycle of the motion. Uh, just to give this, a, a, this uh, well, I, to, I told you about period is the time of this, this system goes through its complete cycle. The system itself can be called an oscillator. Uh, just just a, a name for, for this kind of system. It, it, this, is a, this is an oscillator that has a stable equilibrium that goes through a rhythmic motion that oscillates through this rhythmic motion and comes back to where it started from to, con to continue on to the next cycle of the motion. So just the language. Uh, an oscillator, the cycle of the motion, which is a, uh, it, the, 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 its, its behavior going through the entire motion that, it, that it's able to do. The period is how um, long it takes it to go through the, the cycle and is measured, for example, in seconds. Okay, so that's good enough. So you want to pick for a timekeeper and a clock, which is the agenda here, you want to pick an oscillator that goes through its cycle in a time that does not depend on the amplitude of that cycle. So the period of the cycle, which is how long it takes to go through the cycle, should not depend on the amplitude, which is the size of the cycle. So to make sure that I'm clear on some of the terminology, the system that's going through this motion can be called an oscillator, and it oscillates, which is to say it goes through this cyclic motion, endlessly repeating. Um, the time it takes for an oscillator to go through one cycle, one complete cycle of its motion, so that it ends up back exactly where it started from, both in its position and its velocity, um, that's called the period of oscillation. And the size, typically in space, of the cycle, that is whether it's a little cycle about the stable equilibrium or a big cycle about the stable equilibrium, that's known as the amplitude of oscillation. So those words will come up, uh, they'll naturally come out of my mouth whether I like it or not, but they're really the, 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 the correct terminology, the, the, the widely used terminology to describe systems that go through these rhythmic motions. And there are two important categories or grand categories of oscillators. There are ones that go uh, through their cycle in a, with a period that does depend on how big the motion is, on the amplitude of the motion. So for example, the rocking stool. This is an oscillator with a period of motion that depends on the amplitude of the motion. In contrast, there is also a category of, of oscillators that go through their cycle with a period that does not depend on the amplitude of motion. Uh, an example of that, just to, to give you one here, I'm going to misuse this poor thing as a, pretend it's a pendulum, it's, it's, a, it's a mass on a spring, but forget that for a moment, let's just let it be a weight on a string, and I let it swing back and forth. The swinging motion 
amazingly, doesn't depend, the period of that motion doesn't depend to, to a very good approximation on whether I make it swing a little bit or a lot. This is kind of a, it's, it's hard to do this with a spring as the string and with my hand holding the top. But the basic idea is that, that there are, there exist in nature some oscillators that have this crazy wonderful property that the time it takes them to go through their cycle, their amplitude, ah, they're, <laughs> if I'm going to do it, it's a da moment, I better do it right. They go through their motion back and forth with a period, that is how long it takes to go back and forth, that does not depend on the amplitude of the motion, whether it's a big swing or a little swing. All right. Well, the, ca the, the, the vast catch-all for the, for the oscillators that do not, um, that, that don't have that property, that have periods that depend on amplitude, they're called anharmonic oscillators, anharmonic oscillators. They're, they're, they're the ones that we're going to set aside because they're going to make lousy timekeepers for a clock. Instead, we're going to concentrate on the ones that have this that have this characteristic that they have a period that does not depend on amplitude and those are it, it turns out to, those are the harmonic oscillators and I'm it, by, by introducing harmonic oscillator into that ma uh, manner I am actually reversing cause and effect I'm telling you how a harmonic oscillator behaves without having told you what a harmonic oscillator is Nonetheless, a harmonic oscillator has this lovely characteristic that its period doesn't depend on amplitude. So, having said that now, let's, that's the effect. What's the cause? Uh, what is a harmonic oscillator? Now, a harmonic oscillator is an oscillating system, which is going to be a system that has a, a stable equilibrium. And it has a restoring force. Remember, stable equilibria have, have restoring forces. Forces that, that appear to push the, in order to push whatever it is that's, that, that is the, the system, push it back towards its equilibrium. So it's got an equilibrium, and it's a stable equilibrium, and if you pull the thing away from the, the stable equilibrium, restoring forces show up, right? They, put, they want to push it back. And for a harmonic oscillator, those restoring forces are special. They are proportional to how far the system is away from equilibrium. So if you pull the system a little, a small distance away from equilibrium, you get, I'm going to try to reassemble this little guy for us. OK. If you pull, this, this guy is a harmonic oscillator. At, uh, actually, it, it, I, I, I mean, it's two different kinds of harmonic oscillator. And I'm using it as, <laughs> for both of them. A this, it can be a pendulum as a harmonic oscillator. Or it could be a mass bouncing on a spring as a harmonic oscillator. And in both of those cases, amazingly enough, the restoring force on the object going through the motion is proportional to how far the object is away from the equilibrium. So let me let's think of this as a as, as what's known as a pendulum. So a weight, uh, well, I guess I can call it a mass. It's, it has weight, but and the weight is involved. But it has a, the mass is, is down here, and as I pull it away from equilibrium, a restoring force shows up. Uh, in fact, that's, be, well, that's because of gravity, because as I pull the, the, this object away from equilibrium, it goes upward. It's getting higher. It was, this is its low point, and that ultimately leads to, why, to it being the equilibrium position. As I pull it up, it's got more energy, more potential energy than before. And it swings back and forth about the equilibrium, trying to get rid of that extra energy. And the force that pushes it back, it's, it's a little complicated, and it's not quite perfectly, doesn't quite perfectly fit the bill of a harmonic oscillator, but it's very close. And that force basically is proportional to how far I take it away from the equilibrium. If I take it a little away from equilibrium, a small restoring force shows up. It pushes gently back. If I take it far from equilibrium, the force gets bigger. And it gets bigger roughly in proportion to how far it is away from equilibrium. Okay? So that's one example of a harmonic oscillator. The other example of a harmonic oscillator is 
to consider this mass as a ma this, this is a mass on a spring. I'm going to work up vertically now. No, none of the swinging back and forth of a pendulum. The vertical motion is that of stretching and, and compressing the spring. Gravity seems to be present in the story as well, because of course it pulls everything downward. But because gravity is uniform everywhere, all it does is it shifts everything downward. It doesn't. It doesn't uh, have any important effect on the restoring force about the equilibrium. So gravity shifts the equilibrium downward by stretching everything, stretching the spring. But once we've reached equilibrium, the motion about equilibrium has nothing to do with gravity because gravity is constant. It doesn't, it doesn't care whether the mass is below or above equilibrium. It doesn't change. So it just shifts the equilibrium point and then ignores the rest of the story. But this mass can bounce up and down on the spring. And if you remember Hooke's law, Hooke's law says that a spring behaves, a spring has a restoring force that's proportional to how far you've displaced it from its equilibrium shape. So stretching and compressing a spring gives rise to exactly the right kind of restoring force to make this a harmonic oscillator. So let me put down my toys and just tell you again what a harmonic oscillator is and why it's useful. So a harmonic oscillator is an oscillating system, so it has a stable equilibrium about which it can swing or move or bounce, whatever. And the restoring force in that stable equilibrium system is proportional to how far the, the thing that moves is away from equilibrium. And it really, how, how you move away from equilibrium. It can be a, a, a if it's moved horizontally in, or in a straight line, it's, it's a simple force that pushes back and forth. If it's twisting about an equilibrium, which is another possibility, and it's a torsional act, then it's a torque. It's a restoring torque. But again, proportional to how far you've twisted it, that counts. It's another harmonic oscillator. So there are lots of harmonic oscillators that show, that show up in nature just by accident because so many things are spring-like. So a spring, of course, is spring-like, but so is a, is a stick. So this stick, this, this is very spring-like if you bend it. The, the, the restoring force on this is proportional to, to how far it is bent away from its equilibrium shape. It's a spring. It, this, this will do harmonic oscillator stuff uh, because not only is it, is it a spring, but it also has the mass involved in the whole process. So, uh, yeah, harmonic oscillators then. Just, uh, they're, they're systems that have a stable equilibrium and they have a restoring force that pushes the system back towards equilibrium with, the, with the, that, that restoring force proportional displacement from equilibrium. All right, let me leave that then. And let's go on to see how that shows up in clocks. So you can build clock, a clock out of any oscillator as, as a timekeeper. Clearly, it's worthwhile to set aside all the anharmonic oscillators of the world and focus on the, the harmonic oscillators of the world. So you want systems that have an object that goes through the motion with a restoring, driven by a restoring force that is proportional to displacement so that you get an a period of motion that's independent of amplitude of motion. All right. What are examples of that? Well, the pendulum is one. And I've been trying to, to uh, abuse this poor mass on a spring, as though it were just a, a mass on a string, and swings back and forth. Uh, a pendulum is surely the earliest harmonic oscillator used in clocks. Um, the period of this oscillator does not depend on how big the, the, the amplitude of the swing is. It depends instead on two other things. It depends on the length of the support string. The longer that, that support string is, the weaker the restoring forces are for a given displacement. So if I take this one inch or two inches, you know, or, or ten centimeters away from center, a restoring force shows up. And because this, this support here is rather short, ten centimeters of displacement gives rise to a fairly good force back towards center. If I made the support system even shorter, now, a 10 centimeter displacement, I can barely even do that. The, the restoring force becomes huge. So the point is, the longer this support, support string becomes, the weaker the restoring force gets. If it's a, if it's a, it goes all the way to the ceiling, 
I can pull this thing over here a whole meter before I get very much of a restoring force. So the restoring force in this case weakens with the length of the string and therefore the period gets longer. So we'll discover that the period of this, of this of a pendulum depends on the length of that string and as the string gets longer, the period gets longer. At what rate does the period get longer? Well, for complicated reasons, the, the, the period depends on the square of uh, the square root of the length of, of the string. So uh, sad but true, yeah, square root shows up in it. So if you want to double the period of, of a pendulum, make it take twice as long to go through its motion, you have to lengthen the string by a factor of four. All right. So that's the first influence on the period of motion of a pendulum, the length of the string. The second influence is the strength of gravity. So here on Earth, that's not very uh, adjustable. A little adjustable. If you go into the mountains, it's a little less, um, and so on. But if you could imagine really cranking up gravity, make it really strong, the restoring force on the, the swinging match would get stronger. So gravity also enters the picture, and the period of, of oscillation depends on gravity, and, and the period is, is, is inversely related to, the, to the gravity. Make gravity stronger, the period gets shorter. And again, a square root shows up in this, alas. So, it, it, so there's the, uh, the period depends on one over the square root of gravity, the strength of gravity. And together, the, the, uh, the length of the string, the strength of gravity, together, they determine the, the period of a, of a pendulum. Nothing else matters. Uh, amazingly, the actual mass of the thing swinging back and forth, and there, therefore its weight, uh, has no effect. You can, whether I use a little mass or, or, or a big mass as, the, as that swinging object, not important. For the same reason that all balls fall together when you drop them. If I use a bigger mass on the pendulum, it would be harder to, to drive it through its motion and have more inertia. It would, that by itself would slow down the period of the pendulum. But that larger mass mass also has a larger weight, which means the restoring force gets stronger and pushes the, 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 the swinging bob back and forth more aggressively. And those two finally cancel. So if I doubled the mass of this widget down here, the pendulum would still swing at the same period. It doesn't care. Um, perfect cancellation between the mass slowing things down and the weight speeding things up. All right, so pendulum clocks are, they've been around for, for I wouldn't say forever, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, in addition to the pendulum, what else do you need? You need a counting system that counts the swings of the pendulum. And that's just cl literally clockwork, uh, gears and hands and stuff. What the gears and hands are doing on a, on a pendulum clock is counting the swings and adjusting for the fact that the, the, that the swing on this clock might be different from the swing on another clock so that they move the hands at the official defined rate. They go one minute every minute uh, and so on. Uh, lastly, driving the pendulum through its motion. Well, you can have someone up there giving the pendulum little shoves to keep it going against, finally, it's going to be losing energy. It's going to be losing energy to air resistance, for example, uh, of the swinging object. And there are other ways in which you can waste its energy. And to keep it going, well, first off, you want to make it so that it doesn't lose very much energy to, to the environment. So, so make, the, make the swinging bob, pendulum bob, uh, make it aerodynamic so it slices through the air without creating pressure drag or experiencing pressure drag. But as, as much as you like, trying to get this thing as perfect as you can, you're not going to be able to get the pendulum to swing forever. You're going to have to. Uh, keep adding energy to make up for energy that's wasted in the environment. And that comes, in, in a typical pendulum clock, from descending weights. So you, you'll have a bunch of weights hanging on a, on a chain or a string, descending slowly over the course of days or weeks, and providing the energy that keeps the pendulum going. And, and effectively, you've got mechanisms in the clock that give the pendulum a little push with every swing. They don't push at the bottom, they push at the top, and then they use a rod instead of a string for the swinging motion to, to, to happen. But, but they, they, they keep that, that bob swinging back and forth at roughly the same amplitude uh, day in, day out, uh, 
Uh, there's no point in challenging the harmonic oscillator by deliberately messing with its amplitude between huge and small. That, that will uh, effectively check and see how, how close to being a perfect harmonic oscillator are you. And a pendulum is not quite perfect. It's good, but it's not perfect. And therefore, don't challenge it. Give it about the same amplitude all the time, but you don't have to be like super compulsive about it because the harmonic oscillator aspect of it will tend it to give it the same period uh, no matter what. Okay, so that's pendulum clocks. Energy source, the descending weights. Counting mechanism, the clockwork system of, of gears and so on to move the hands. And finally, the timekeeper is a harmonic oscillator known as a pendulum, which is a, an object swinging back and forth at the end of a, of a string or, or rod. What's another possibility? Well, pendulum clocks have a limitation that, that is you can't move them about. Uh, you, if you move them, you've got to adjust for a change, any change in gravity. And furthermore, you can't tip them. And during the movement, they're not going to keep time well because the pendulum bob is going to be going crazy. So pendulum clocks, not portable and not movable. So, um, or not easily movable. So what are you going to do to make a movable, portable clock? Well, people turn next to what's known as a, a balance ring, a torsional harmonic oscillator as the timekeeper. And a torsional harmonic oscillator consists really of an object that rocks back and forth and has a rotational mass associated with it and a spring that tries to, to rotate this, the, 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 that ring, tries to rotate the ring into a certain orientation. So it's got a, the ring has an equilibrium orientation determined by the spring. And the spring is typically a coil of wire, so it's got it's able to, to deal with a, ro a rotating motion. And this then, together, that spring and, and the rotating ring, which looks a lot like a wheel, like the wheel of a bicycle, that, that uh, system, it has a stable equilibrium, which is the or orientation that the spring likes, and the restoring torque, when you take it away from its equilibrium orientation, the restoring torque is proportional to how far you take it away because it's, it's a spring and its springs obey Hooke's law pretty closely. So it's a really good harmonic oscillator, S you know, strikingly good, done properly. It's really close to a perfect harmonic oscillator. And that means that the period of, of the motion depends, has, is, it does not depend on the amplitude of the motion. So what does it depend on? It depends on two things. The inertia, in this case rotational, inertia of the little wheel, the little ring, how much it wants to keep doing what it was doing. And the stiffness of the spring, in this case a torsional spring, how much it wants that wheel to go back to the equilibrium. The two fight each other. And actually this is, this is almost universally true of harmonic oscillators. They have an inertial character to them and they have a spring-like restoring character to them. The two of them, those two characteristics, they battle it out. The, the inertial part wants to keep going straight and keep doing what it's doing. And the restoring force part keeps pulling the system back, accelerating it back towards equilibrium. Every time uh, the, the system gets, only gets to equilibrium, it arrives there moving and it coasts by, because of inertia right through equilibrium and out the other side. And then it has to be reeled back in by the restoring torque, and it, it eventually comes back. The, the restoring force or torque overcomes inertia and, and, and gets, the, gets the thing to come roaring back, and it coasts right through equilibrium out the other side. And now the restoring force is like, oh no, gotta do it again. So it's a constant battle between a, inertia and a restoring force, uh, a, a harmonic spring like restoring force. Uh, it's even most, more easily seen in a you know, mass bouncing on a spring, which is essentially the, the prototypical harmonic oscillator. The spring-like restoring force is literally a spring. The inertial thing aspect is literally a mass with its inertia. And this guy bounces back and forth about the, the stable equilibrium. It, it keeps going through equilibrium because of inertia and turning around and coming back because of the restoring force of the spring. And it goes back and forth. It, you know, inertia is ascended, and then the, the spring like restoring force is ascended. They go back and forth, who's in charge, who's winning, and over and over the whole thing goes through its motion. Okay, so back to a, a balance ring clock. In a balance ring clock, uh, 
the motion goes back and forth. It's a little wheel, little ring, goes back and forth about an, a, uh, an angular or an orientation e equilibrium, a certain or equilibrium orientation. And as it goes back and forth, it, it coasts, each time it coasts through the equilibrium, driven by rotational inertia, and then it's reeled back in by the, by the, the torque of the spring, its restoring force, and it goes back and forth. And the rhythm is determined entirely by the rota rotational mass of the little ring's wheel system and the stiffness of the spring. And you can figure this out yourself. The stiffer the spring, the faster the motion completes. So the period, the period uh, is inversely related to the stiffness of the spring. And there's going to be a square root in that too. And the inertial part, the more inertia you're dealing with, the longer the period's going to get. So the, so the period's going to be related to the rotational mass of this little guy. And again, it's going to have a square root in there, just because it will. So, so you can change the period of this little timekeeper by stiffening the spring or, or softening it. And you can also change the, time, the timekeeper's period by varying the rotational, rotational mass of the little wheel. Okay, so the little balance ring clocks were the classic portable clock. It was used not only in a clock that you could carry around with you, but one you could wear on your wrist or put in a little pocket. You know, pocket watches, wrist watches were all balance ring watches for, for centuries. In the modern era, and before uh, watches became passe except as, as, uh, as jewelry, uh, and cell phones took over really, right? Uh, in the modern era, the timekeeper has evolved to be, become a piece of quartz. Why quartz? Quartz is a very hard crystalline material, and amazingly enough, it is any piece of quartz is already at least one harmonic oscillator. Uh, how so? Well, if you just take a, 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 an object, a chunk of quartz, and you can compress that quartz away from its equilibrium shape, to make it thinner. And if you let go, it will experience restoring forces on its own self. It will push it back towards the equilibrium. And as it gets there, it'll be moving. It'll coast right through the equilibrium and get a little too wide. So you, so you might start by compressing it so that it's a little too narrow and it will and let go. And it will bounce back and forth about too narrow, too wide, too narrow, too wide, too narrow, too wide, back and forth many, many, many times. That's a harmonic oscillator. Why? Because the, the bulk of the of the quartz have, develops a restoring force when you pull it away from equilibrium, either by stretching it or squeezing it, and the restoring forces are amazingly close to proportional to how far you pull them away from from equilibrium. So it's intrinsically a harmonic oscillator. So a just a chunk, just a, a, a block or a cylinder of quartz will do this, and it doesn't have to be quartz, but quartz is a good choice. We'll see in a minute. Um, it will go back and forth and back and forth rhythmically and it will keep time. And how do you pick the period of this motion? Well, you can't really adjust the stiffness of quartz. It's given to you by the, the material, quartz. But you can change how big the piece is and therefore how much mass it effectively has, how much the inertial aspect, how far, going back and forth. And it turns out that the period of this motion is proportional to, is, it was inversely related to the length of, of the chunk, the width of the chunk, I guess, in this case. So a big wide chunk of quartz will go slowly, not very slowly, but slowly, compared to a very narrow chunk of quartz. And so a little, little pieces of quartz will go very fast, back and forth, back and forth. And they're wonderfully useful in electronics. They're not so useful as timekeepers because that motion is so fast that if you're, if you're going to make a clock that counts the motions, which you do, that's what wristwatches, uh, modern wristwatches do, quartz wristwatches. They count the motions. The motions are so many per second, millions per second. You don't want to count that many because it takes energy to do the counting that fast. It's, that's, a, that's an excessive amount of counting energy. Your battery will run out too fast. So you want to slow this down. So how do you slow it down? You slow it down by cutting out the middle of that chunk of quartz, so it, it's, it, it's hollowed out. And you can't hollow out completely because then you have two separate chunks. So what do you do? You turn it into a fork. So like a tuning fork. In fact, exactly like a tuning fork. So the, my wristwatch right there, 
has a tiny little quartz tuning fork in it. And the tuning fork still has quartz in there that's providing the restoring force, but it's at the bottom, one piece, of, it's not, not the whole bulk of the quartz, but just the bottom portion here. And the two ends move in and out, toward each other, away from each other, toward, away. And they do this, uh, they have a stable equilibrium, which is as they were perfectly, as they were cut, and they move back and forth about that based on the stiffness of this lower arc that connects the two, the two tines of the tuning fork. And what else? Well, the, 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 the period depends on how much mass there is in these two, these two tines and on how stiff that base is. And the motion back and forth of a small tuning fork can take something like uh, one fifteen thousandth of a second. And it's, or one thirty-two thousandth of a second. They, they specifically pick a certain rhythm so that they can count. It's, first of all, the rhythm's got to be fast enough that we can't hear it with our ears because it makes a little bit of sound. It launches a little bit of sound waves. So you don't want a tuning fork that goes back and forth in the audible range because we'll hear it. But you can take it out of the audible range. Uh, it may be that some animals are bothered by quartz washes, but okay. They haven't complained yet. And then you, then you have electronics to do the counting. And Simple's electronics uh, does very nicely counting to 32,768, which is 2 to the 15th. I believe I got that right. So um, the little tuning fork sits there and vibrates back and forth. Well, that leaves only two things left. Actually, and I should, first of all, I should say that, that the, this motion which is typically done in vacuum, so they get the air out around the tuning fork. They put it in a little container that's got no air in it, so there's no air resistance. That motion will, will go on for a very long time, lots of cycles, without losing much energy. And that helps to make the, this a, a very accurate to, uh, timekeeper. Uh, it's very easy to count the period, to measure the period of something that keeps moving uh, rhythmically over and over and, and doesn't lose much energy between cycles. If it, an oscillator that loses, even a harmonic oscillator, that loses a lot of energy between cycles, leaves you a little uncertain about when to say that you've gotten back to where you started from. That is, what's the end of the period? Because it started doing a big movement and it ended partway in doing a smaller movement for the next cycle. So where do you actually say, ah, you're back there? What defines the, the end of the period, well, period interval of time? It's a little messy. So a Harmonic oscillator that maintains its energy beautifully, cycle after cycle after cycle, has a very well-defined period, and therefore measures time very can be used to measure time very accurately. Okay, so quartz quartz watch. It's the, the period is 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 determined by the physical geometry of the little tuning fork. The restoring force, ultimately, the inertia together conspire to give you this well-defined period. How do you get this thing moving and keep it moving, it does need a little energy added to it, otherwise it really will eventually stop. So you need the energy, the energy source. And you also need the counting system, where you count the intervals, count the number of ticks it makes. How do you do that? Well, that's why quartz is such a lovely choice. There are other materials that could, have, could be used, but quartz has the characteristic of being what's known as piezoelectric, which means that it's mechanical uh, motion is coupled to its electrical char uh, characteristics. The two talk to each other. A if you ch change its shape, electrical things happen to it. And if you change electrical things, its shape changes. They're, they're, they're connected one to the other. An example of a piezoelectric material is a spark starter on a gas grill when you put, or, or a gas stove. When you, when you smack that, that piezoelectric crystal, the mechanical impact change in shape causes an electrical effect, which only leads to a spark. Um, as for the reverse of an electrical system that, that, that causes mechanical change, things like an ultrasonic cleaner uses an electrical uh, activities to cause a piezoelectric crystal to change shape. So it, it uh, you can create sound that way. Uh, it's used in, in, in ultrasound, in, in, in uh, in medicine, you know, where does the ultrasound come from? It comes from piezoelectric systems. Okay, back to the quartz tuning fork. 
they get that little tuning fork moving rhythmically using electrical pulses. So electrical pulses get it going. And it, it responds mechanically to electrical effects. And then they count the motions by listening back. Uh, they, can, they can sense the mechanical motion because it affects electrical things. So the, so the counting system is watching the crystal move using electrical sensors. And the, the energy system that keeps it going is making it move electrically. And the two work together beautifully. And it, it goes on and on and on and on. Um, of course, the quartz, the quartz uh, tuning fork has to be, has to have just the right period for the clock that, to, to count it properly. So how do they adjust the period of that tuning fork? Because when you make thousands and thousands of these little tuning forks, it's very hard to make it exactly the same every single time. So they actually do adjust them. And the way they adjust them is they put a little bit of metalization on the surface of, of the quartz. Uh, they need that metalization there, metal, you know, a thin film of metal, because they need to, to have these, this electrical interaction with the quartz. So they need metal there anyway. But they can put the metal on, they put a little too much on, which means that there's too much inertia, um, and there, therefore the period is a little too long initially. It's, the, the quartz is swinging about too much mass. It's hard, it's hard, I'm going slow. Okay, then they remove excess metalization using a laser. They just burn off the metal, and they burn it off very carefully, so they stop burning off metal right when the tuning fork hits the right uh, period. And so just before packaging, whoop, they, 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 they measure the period and they just it until it's just right, speed up the period a little bit by taking off some of that metal and pop it into a, into a, a sealed cylinder, take out the air, put it in a watch, and you're in business. Okay, so that's the story of clocks. It's really a story about harmonic oscillators since any uh, reasonably accurate clock these days is built on a harmonic oscillator. Uh, this, this does set aside atomic clocks, which are just fundamentally different. The timekeeper is just, it's not a harmonic oscillator. It's, not a, it's, it's an atomic system that's different. And so all the, all the, por the portable clocks that you normally use or encounter are, are based on harmonic oscillators. The, the, the salient, the, the most valuable feature of, the, of, of harmonic oscillators is that they have a period that doesn't depend on the amplitude of motion so that the people building the clock can really relax on how carefully they have to control the, the, the size and uh, physical dimensions of the motion. And harmonic oscillators themselves, again, they are systems that have a stable equilibrium and a restoring force that pushes the system back towards equilibrium. And that restoring force is proportional to displacement from equilibrium. So the farther you take it away, the, the stronger the restoring force gets and uh, you only get a period of motion that doesn't depend on amplitude yeah, in the harmonic oscillator.